And we're looking at the second of the Olympic planetary spirits in our series as we go through the sequence of major arcana suggested in the order of Valentin Tomberg, which is basically the same order that we're familiar with post Elifa Levy and the Golden Dawn, with the exception of the Fool card being put before the world at the very end. So for those of you who want to know why we're studying things in the order that we're studying them in is we're following Valentin Tomberg's pattern of exercises as set forth in Meditations on the Tarot. So last week we looked at Ophiel as we looked at the Magician card, and this week we are looking at Fool. So the Olympic Planetary Spirits, quick recap, appeared in 1575 when they were published in Latin, in, uh, in Basel, in Switzerland, and became very quickly one of the most popular grimoires of, of white magic and one of the first grimoires of explicitly white magic. And then that text made its way into Agrippa's fourth book of occult philosophy. So attributed to Agrippa, pseudo Agrippa, as it's called, because it was not actually stuff written by Agrippa, as his students uh, often decried, such as Johann Weyer, who, of course, did the famous pseudo monarchia daemonum, which is sort of the sort of a joke grimoire of the Goetic spirits, but then got taken very seriously and, and became a very popular tradition, as we're all aware. And of course, whether it's fully a joke or not is is sort of debatable. And I'll, it's been that's been discussed at length elsewhere. I think it's one of the favorite topics of, uh, of Dr. Sledge and other academics to, to uh, consider how um, magical texts that weren't meant to be done seriously often get taken more seriously and become a tradition out of a out of what was originally sort of a joke. Uh, Turner, Robert Turner, uh, included the Arbitel of magic in his fourth book of occult philosophy translation in 1655, and uh, the Arbitel continued to be included in in collections of Agrippa's works thereafter. Um, after after a while, Agrippa's texts and books, his three books of occult philosophy that we all know so well, started just being included with a bunch of uh, different manuscripts and, and texts that were all called under the title Opus. So Agrippa's Opus, and you could find this in different languages in different places, and they'd often have different collections of texts, either written by Agrippa or not written by Agrippa, depending on uh, probably whoever you could convince to buy it. So the original publication date is 1575. We, we suspect it was written somewhere between 1536 and 1563. And uh, given the title Arbitel, the magic of the ancients. When Davies, a great academic scholar of who wrote this wonderful book on grimoires, doesn't talk about it much, actually, surprisingly, given how popular the Arbitel became. And, and it would have probably remained, some say, the most popular grimoire um, since its publication, if it weren't sort of eclipsed by John Dee's Enochian work and its uh, subsequent promulgation by the Golden Dawn and, and Aleister Crowley, and that sort of eclipsed what may have been either, really the Arbitel uh, as the most popular grimoire known today. But yeah, Enochian sort of uh, popped up and took its place. In his own copy, one of the interesting points here is, is Homagius, this uh, very cool sounding schoolmaster, in my opinion, probably very uh, sort of a proto Waldorf school, it sounds like he was running back in the 17th century. Um, in his own copy of the opus, he notes about the Arbitel, I wrote this and was happy to complete it on May 4th, 1617. So how could... Homagius have finished writing the Arbitel in 1617 when it was first published in 1575. How how is anyone's guess? So there's a yeah, it, there's no explanation for that that I could find. But it's an interesting little note.
of course, people are often trying to take credit for things, and it could have been a reference to something else. It's just just uh, one of those curious uh, scratchings in someone's text that is worth repeating. Davies also notes how these magical texts appeal to reform theology in general. The, the Neoplatonic discourses, he says, on the angelic and spiritual hierarchies contained in the Arabitel, in Heptamron, Book 3, and the fourth book of occult philosophy, and in the Steganographia, which is by the abbot Trithemius. And the keys they provide to direct celestial communication appealed to the prophetic and revelatory aspects of Protestant theology. And this is, of course, the key difference between Protestant theology and Catholic theology, the idea of sola scriptura versus sola ecclesia, as, as the debate became known. And sola scriptura means only through scripture, and sola ecclesia means only through the church. And what are they talking about? What is the only thing that they're talking about? Revelation. Revelation is the key debate. So how do you get divine revelation? Well, the Catholic Church, which to this day in its dogma and teachings um, considers the idea that there's any aspect of the divine in a human being, heretical. There is, like, you might be surprised to hear this given we've been studying Tomberg's work so much and given how many Catholic mystics are so famous. But in Catholic theology, it's a complete no-no. It's a heresy that there's any aspect of the divine in us. There's no, there's no bit of God in you, according to the Roman Catholic Church. This might seem brazenly uh, 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 contrary to many Catholic think speakers and teachers and mystics and writers that you've heard. But that's the beautiful thing about Catholicism. In some ways, it's still the best polytheism. There's a lot of different views that are allowed to live and breathe within the Roman Catholic Church. Um, most of them just aren't technically official according to the unchanging dictates and theologies that govern the ecclesia. However, they they give a pass and a wide wide range of operation to their membership, which is one of the ways that the Roman Catholic Church has maintained its supremacy in the Christian world to, to an extent. It's still the largest of the uh, flavors of Christianity. But the idea that came along with the reformers and the reform theology is the idea of sola, sola ecclesia. So the revelation and divine truth does not come through the church at all. It comes through the scripture. And of course, this developed hand in hand with the publication and the translation of the Bible from Latin into German and other common languages and the printing press. So the Gutenberg printing press, this is what there would have been no reformation without the printing press and without the translation and publication and printing of the Bible. That's just a simple fact. So all of a sudden, Christians could have the church in their hand. The revelation came straight from the book. And the Arbitel was written into this environment. And it was written in a way that's very aware of the environment it's coming into. It's written with that awareness. It's also written with an awareness of medieval magic or the modern ideas that that it's sort of... Uh, challenging it's challenging old the, the medieval grimoire magic and proposing new ways of approaching this stuff and drawing on its uh, on its authority for that ancient neoplatonic teachings as a as a counter argument to the medieval ways of practicing magic and for the medieval reasons for practicing magic yeah so you can see how you know the as soon as you realize that that a whole swath of christians are now believing god can talk directly to them than any, then, then this is a very healthy environment for a lot of, for certain forms of magic to, to appear and thrive. And the Arbitel took advantage of this in, in a major way. Owen Davies, another great passage from him is, he says, it has been said that the reason for this was because printed editions had no intrinsic value. Yeah, so Davies notes that printed grimoires didn't diminish the market after the, the pub printing presses came along. And the reason for that is actually because they couldn't keep up with demand. So many people wanted printed grimoires that they had to keep creating manuscript versions because they couldn't keep up with the demand of how many people even wanted printed ones. It was a, it was a big industry. For this reason, because printed editions had no intrinsic value, as high magic required the ritualized transcription and consecration of each individual grimoire, this is undoubtedly 
a significant factor, but increasing numbers of users were not earnest seekers of magical enlightenment, assiduously carrying out the stipulated fastings, consecrations, and other preparations. They just wanted quick fix conjurations and the basic details on what to say and where to say it. This is an idea. This is a, something that was, again, not just happening in the magical world but this was even a part that's a that whole way of thinking is a part of what was problematic in the reform reform tradition breaking away from roman catholic traditions because of the uh the relics the whole industry that had arisen around paying money standing in lines you know people going to rome and standing in lines for days on end to touch the thigh bone of some saint pay a bunch of money to get their grandmother 15 years off in purgatory or 75 years off in purgatory so this magical uh relic and reliquary kind of uh, economy was not just amongst wizards and witches it was mainstream christian culture um and it was something Martin Luther had a had a really big problem with. A lot of people had a big problem with what was going on in the uh, <laughs> you know get selling selling people less time off their post post uh, death prison sentence in purgatory, um, all for some money. And so, but you see that that idea reflected in the in the publication of the Arbitel, where a lot of, it's really eschewing a lot of the older. Um, techniques and and tools of magical practice in exchange for more simple things like like faith and uh moving away from the idea that you can just recite a spell and, at the and make some sigil and have a quick fix and have a, just a conjuration resulting in your problems going away at the same time while the arbitel does then focus on faith and and generosity and, and love of thy neighbor for example over those sorts of mechanistic magical practices it does still have a method of doing that kind of mechanistic magical practice such as when you summon uh, like if, if you're working with the olympic planetary spirit of fool and you want to be able to do something it'll assign you a, a spirit to help you do that or maybe even give you a sigil with which to use to do that thing and then you would use that sigil on the day in the hour to achieve that goal and of course the grimoire says that it is guaranteed to work because you know it's hard to sell grimoires where where they're where it's like him yeah, <laughs> it's like give me all this money and it might work <laughs> it's uh yeah the big promises are a big part of what allowed them to be sold so yeah this was it wasn't just because manuscripts also had an aura about them which even back then practitioners did believe uh, were important to have handwritten manuscripts, handwritten grimoires. They thought the printed ones weren't really going to do it for you, and you had to transcribe it even from there. That was something. That's something that hasn't really ever gone away. Um, there's, there's certainly lots of magicians that don't transcribe things and just use printed materials, and it seems to work. But uh, depends on what your what your personal. Uh, taste is i suppose i'm i like the traditional method of transcribing things and and connecting with them more deeply but yeah sometimes especially when you're doing long rituals and doing a lot of them you just have to print them out and and go through them that way so yes there was a high demand for printed materials they couldn't keep up with even the printing of those materials leading to the continuance of a, of a handwritten grimoire economy. Um, one of the major articles on the Arbitel, other than uh, well, is 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 Carlos Gilly's article in a book in Italian, and it's a chapter that has the English in it. I'll include it in a link after this, uh, the follow up to this lecture for all of you who want to read the Carlos Gilly article. It's a good one. Uh, lots of footnotes, lots of details. And he says, we are completely in the dark about the actual author of Arbitel. So this is the final word in the coffin. We still don't know. The only thing which may be said about him with any certainty is that he was undoubtedly an enthusiastic follower of Hermes, Trismegistus, and Paracelsus, as well as a great expert in medieval and Renaissance magic. Um, so we don't know who wrote it. And the reason is obvious, because they probably wouldn't have fared so well. Um, famous bishop in the town it was published in named Sulzer denounced it from the pulpit like multiple Sundays um, but no criminal action was ever taken probably because they didn't know who to take the action against they proposed taking action against the publisher but 
you know, the publisher a few years later republished. So it seems to have been okay. And uh, it, it was a, uh, it was considered a naughty book and and anti-Christian, but not bad enough to uh, really uh, get you punished or or burnt. Though plenty of people got um, executed for having the Arbitel in their possession in in the following years, in the following centuries. All right, bull and the Olympic planetary spirits themes of the Arbitel. The microcosmic magic of the Arbitel corresponds with the magical part of the Astronomio Naturalis of Paracelsus, the natural magic, which uh, comes from the firmament, it comes from the fact that we're made of the earth, and it comes from the earth as well, just like our bodies, and it's part of the scientia um, of the microcosmic existence of, of man here on earth. So we're part of the earth, and there's magic that comes to us from the earth and it's tied to our body to our microcosm but then there is a higher kind of magic that paracelsus would talk about and this is where the olympic spirits really do come from they do predate the arbitel they come from paracelsus not originally from the arbitel but how much of them paracelsus published is still uh, unknown given it looks like some of the main manuscripts that Paracelsus might have written about the Olympic spirits uh, vanished and might have then pub been published later on as uh, pseudonymous uh, texts by either his students or people just pretending that he wrote them and made them up themselves we don't actually know but there's a major text uh, that's a good example of something that may have been the tradition of Paracelsus's thinking on the Olympic spirits, uh, whether it was written by him or his student or a transmission of multi-ear oral knowledge that got published, we don't know. And that text is the Arcan Arcanum Arcanorum. And that's what um, Frater Ackers made a major study of in the Holy Heretics book he just put out. And he's planning a full book on Olympic spirits in the future, which we're all very excited about because a lot of us, like like myself, who I got into this Olympic spirits many decades ago two decades ago you know in the mid 90s and we didn't know what to do with them really there wasn't much of a sense of what to do with them so i i worked with them each a little bit but after that it's like well i'm gonna wait for, to, for there to be some more scholarship and some more knowledge before devoting more time to them it didn't seem like uh something that i was cut out for at that date but now we have, uh, of course, the major works by Joseph Peterson and uh, the critical edition he put out from, which is a brand new translation of the 1575 Latin text. Whereas mostly we've been stuck with Turner's text, which had obvious errors, which we're going to look at in a minute. So the kind of magic that Paracelsus is talking about, which then the Arbitels either inspired by, based on, or is a oral transmission re-emerging from Paracelsus's actual teachings and currents of students, is uh, the Astronomia Olympi Novi. This astronomia springs from faith, and this is the key thing. Therefore, that which the nat natural heaven is able to do, and so even more this astronomia. The sapientia, which means wisdom or prophetic magic, is that which is called magia celestis by Paracelsus, a subdivision of astronomia supera because it has its essential dwelling place with the heavenly ones in heaven and is given to those who are in the new birth and it originates in Christ and is fulfilled, applied and revealed by those who are his followers. Now, the reason I, this is getting a bit into some of the weeds and unnecessary weeds of Paracelsian thought and categories, but the reason I, I included this quote is because there's a contrary view of the Olympic spirits and the whole Arbitel that we looked at last time when we considered the Olympic spirits and Ophiel. And that's the view probably best represented by uh, Nick Farrell, though it certainly predates Nick Farrell. A lot of people have suspected that due to the name Olympic or Olympian, that this was a way of kind of smuggling in pagan deities or the gods of the planets. Uh, Farrell's argument is that the Olympic planetary spirits represent all the gods of those planets or that correspond to those planets or any gods that could correspond to any planet at any time. So some someone, for example, he would say you could even correspond St. Paul to an Olympic planetary spirit, but not just to one, to multiple ones, depending on which kind of spirit of Paul you're creating or conjuring so there are differing views on what the 
or original purpose of, of these are is it is it a way for for calvinist christians and reformers to to smuggle in pagan worship and divine magic into their christianity i'm not so convinced it might be it might have been that could have been the reason or it could have been more of a cosmological um uh, adoption which is very much in the tradition of Paracelsus and Agrippa and Trithemius, of course. But why would you need to sort of veil that they're pagan deities if it's already in a book of magic that's being condemned from pulpits and, you know, could get you executed in, if you're in the wrong place at the wrong time with it? So I'm not so sure about that. But again, it's you can you can uh, consider that for yourself. So but what here we see a, a clear a clear indicator that the text is ostensibly written for Christians and for followers of Jesus. Whether that's a, a just a way of covering its own ass so that you know you're less likely to be condemned or or caught by the inquisition and and burned and hung it's it's a uh, it's debatable. All right, so moving on to the major themes. I've listed the major themes identified by Peterson in the introduction to his critical edition of the book, which is the best edition to get. It's not very big. It's a thin little one. Very easy to find online. But when it comes to ancient authorities versus experimentation, the emphasis in the Arbitel is on direct experience. So rather than just taking um, the the ancient authorities, which would have been the grimoire writers, really, of the medieval period. So rather than taking medieval authority on its word, which, of course, also meant Catholic authority, listen to your own experience. This is, again, in line with this the shift from Catholic to Protestant theology. And that, of course, refers also to the reliance and the fact that the Arbitel draws on Neoplatonic sources as classical ancient knowledge, which is why it's called the Magia Viterum, the magic of the ancients, because it's drawing on Neoplatonic thought to bring into the Protestant reform theology as a foil to medieval Roman Catholic theology and thinking. Predestination or predisposition. Um, magicians in the Arbitel are predetermined. You're called to be a magician. You're called to do magic. And I think this is just such a delightful little sneaky way. I'm not sure if anyone would agree with me on this interpretation, but it's just a nice little nudge to accept magic as divinely ordained. Because if you're a Calvinist and you believe that you know God's already laid everything out in the future, well, if God called you to do magic and practice magic and summon spirits, you could be, you say to your Calvinist brothers, hey, this is, this is, I had no choice, right? This is what God predetermined for me. I can't resist God, can I? So that's, that's a, it's a cute little thing there. The, the emphasis on, hey, you're called to do this. So you have no choice. If, if you want to go to heaven, you have to, you have to accept your predisposition. Um, there, you definitely, there's an invitation in that idea to consider whether some people are more called to magic than others. That, of course, goes without saying. I mean, you can question that possibility yourself. Piety and service. The grimoire emphasizes uh, service to humanity. The, the main work purpose of magical work is to help your neighbors in this book, not to help yourself. And it emphasizes community over seclusion, which again is a, is a break from previous grimoire tradition. Um, in attitude, it's, it's a similar thing. The, I, the idea of having gratitude and reverence and um, humility and all these good Christian pietistic virtues as essential to practicing the magic and if you don't have them it warns you that you could even risk death so um yeah that's a quite a difference uh number five the the gods angels and spirits now this is the seems to be the first grimoire there may be a, a previous grimoire, but it, it looks like it's the first grimoire source of the idea that we attract bad spirits by our bad attitudes and behavior. 
we do see this idea in early Gnostic thoughts and other some other late Platonic thinking where the universe is just filled with spirits and you attract different spirits and they come into depending on how you behave, uh, what your virtues and ethics are versus your sins and, and, and failings as a person. Um, you know, that's an idea that's been around for a very long time. Today, still doing alive and well in the form of Scientology. And uh, it's certainly part of this grimoire, the idea that if you uh, uh, have bad luck, maybe it's because you got a bad attitude and you're attracting bad spirits. So that, that's an idea we, we see uh, strongly in, in the Arbitel. The aims of magic are all contained in one aphorism. The whole book, of course, is uh, seven by seven aphorisms, so 49 aphorisms. And the Arbitel, in case you didn't, you weren't here last time, is, is one tome out of what's meant to be nine tomes. But the other nine were, uh, the, uh, the other of the nine were probably never written. There's certainly no trace of them. Um, and it, it's certainly within magical style to, if you were to create a grimoire to make claims that there's other more secret texts or fuller editions that you plan to do in the future or just want people to think that you're going to do in the future as a, as a way to sort of blow uh blow up your reputation and uh or maybe make more money on the sale of the manuscript because we do know for a fact that it was a big industry for those who could read and write to manufacture beautiful manuscripts and sell them to wealthy people that was never forget that that was a thing of the aims of magic there's seven greater aims seven medium aims seven lesser aims and all of them have as the priority of helping your neighbor which i think is very nice so what a great thing to do magic for we should all do that more often and the method it goes into detail about as well less demanding than other grimoires the the main the main requirements aren't aren't some of these exotic tools and uh, timings but more so just the the faith the the faith alone or pious attitude of a charitable life are the main re prerequisites because that is what allows god to then do the magic for you through grace and give you the grace of helping you with these spirits and again that is just so parallel to the the changes and and breaks between uh roman catholic and protestant theology it's 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 uh it's clear as day the difference of of faith over works is the other thing a, a lot parallel to sola scriptura through just the scripture through just the church by which divine revelation comes is parallel to that the idea of through through faith alone or through works alone so either the roman catholic idea that only your good works are going to save you and the protestant idea is it doesn't matter what you do it's your faith alone that's going to save you you need the faith the right faith saves you roman catholic good deeds the right work saves you and you see actually a really interesting form of the of the faith alone theology that manifested in the american south in a fascinating way known as the grace walk some of you probably are smiling or nodding going oh and i know i've heard of that yeah and this is the final form of the grace of 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 that that protestant ethic and it's the of course the idea that once you're saved or baptized um you're forgiven automatically for everything you're ever going to do and so you can do whatever you want that is one version of interpretation of the of of the grace um uh, salvation through faith alone and it's quite interesting as it is somewhat contrary to uh the the debate in uh, in uh, saint augustine's time around the fact that there was a there was an issue in the catholic church and with some of the warring denominations in those early days around the fact that in the bible there's a place that it actually says there's no forgiveness for sin after baptism and that's the reason why constantine got baptized on his deathbed because he wanted to <laughs> not accidentally sin after he was baptized and go to hell fun fact it's a it's a little known fact about constantine so other than that, uh, the Arbitel touches on some numerology and some mnemonics, and we're not going to get into some of the details of that. And it's, they're not huge sections in the Arbitel, but they're interesting sections. And it also touches on the main magical creatures, the pygmies, which are like gnomes, the sagani, uh, nymphs, and dryads. There's some very interesting uh, interpretations of the nymphs, dryads, and sylphs that would be maybe seen as jarring, given how we interpret those creatures today. But 
Uh, you can investigate that for yourself and see how these mythological creatures that we we like to s clearly align them each to the four elements. And they do line up here in the Arbitel, but there's a bit more nuance and, and fluidity to them, flexibility than we're used to. Oh, all right. So uh, another final note from Paracelsus before we move on to into the weeds of the, the, the spirit full itself. He says, uh, Paracelsus says, the things are performed by the Olympic. These things are performed by the Olympic spirit, which tears the shadow from all works of the body. The art of Gabalistica with its annexes resides in the Olympic spirit. And according to this art, the imagination is even stronger in him who may count on the conjunction of the Olympian spirits. And at the same time, he knows that just as the visible bodies may unite, Likewise, in man, the Olympian spirits of creation, which are the constellations in man, may unite. These things are written in the books of Gabalia. You've heard many people argue around, around the best spelling for Kabbalah, but I bet you've never seen that spelling for Kabbalah before. Ah, there you go. That's that's just because the it's a old German and or Latin, and the the G and the K, G and K are similar sounds. So yeah. Kabbalah was sometimes Kabbalah, as we see here. Gilly also notes about Paracelsus was the first, to, in addition to being the first to mention the Olympic spirits and the Olympian spirit um, and writing about them. He says that these things are performed by the Olympian spirits, which tears the shadow from the body. And the idea that that these spirits are are more than just independent, servient spirits or or like gods is really here from the beginning in Paracelsus's description. So when you see this sort of struggle amongst modern magicians and scholars to categorize the Olympic spirits properly, to say either they contain all gods or they are the spirits of the planets or the spirits behind the planets, which would make them similar to sort of the Gnostic idea of the Archons, except maybe a, a little less uh, um, sinister than the Archons, you know, debatably. But yeah, it's because of this paracelsus's note and so like the arbitel could have just been written by someone who knew paracelsus work and was like oh it's too bad he never got to write this i'm going to write this and and a learned person could have done that or it could have been part of paracelsus's oral teachings or lost teachings that got transmitted carried down and then emerged a little while later in the form of this book um more of that sort of oral transmission is discussed by acker and his holy heretics which is i highly recommend you read now looking at um, one interesting uh, textual issue between the 1575 edition in Latin, now retranslated by uh, Peterson, and the the version as most of us um, practicing in the 90s knew it through the fourth book of occult philosophy, um, there was always a discrepancy, which of course also therefore made its way into Golden Dawn grade material. The listing of 190 six provinces instead of 186 so uh stephen skinner just believes that it was a misprint that that in the fourth book of occult philosophy the provinces were listed as 186 and you can see that it was obviously an error because the provinces which each of the olympic spirits governs in sequences of seven so each one governs seven less than the one before it but if you went with the fourth book of occult philosophy numeration, you uh, would not have that pattern. You'd have 49, then 32, then 35. And that just obviously wouldn't make any sense. You also see some alternate spellings in the fourth book of occult philosophy, such as Arathor, Arathon, Bether, and Felic, instead of the proper ones from the Arbitel itself. The last little note is each of the spirits rules for 490 years, uh, a 490 year epoch. Um, Hagith just ended in 1900 and we're currently in the epoch of Ophiel. And, you know, I was thinking briefly, just as I was preparing everything, of course, this week and contemplating what each of the spirits do, because of course, some of them do some rather far out things according to the grimoire. And Hagith in, in that epoch, transmutes metals and i was thinking well in that time we sort of have developed the ability to transmute metals and ophiel is meant to 
expand life, extend life as well. They all extend life by a long time. It's this idea that that the magic predicted in the past is manifesting today just as technology. 